Welcome to the SCOM podcast. This is our security and compliance podcast created by Quarter Cloud. I'm Kelly and I work at the marketing department. And I'm Phil from the technical team. And we're going to take you through all our technology in a really interesting way. Phil Talks Technical, where I keep it lighthearted with a selection of exciting guest speakers. Let's delve in. Okay, thank you for joining us. And today's a very great episode actually because it's a customer is actually here with us today and this is um, we're really delighted to introduce Craig here into the podcast room in the castle so thank you very much for coming in Craig today to talk to us to me and Phil um, so it would be great for everyone to know a little bit about you and we've learned a lot about you today um, but about your your journey and also you're quite recent into the NHS so how you've got there and and also I guess why you chose to move to the NHS that's quite interesting of going from corporate to NHS. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Craig Bromwich. I'm the Head of Infrastructure at Samwell and West Birmingham Hospitals Trust and I've been in role about 18 months now. So I joined at the start of the pandemic uh, last year. Um, previously, I've probably spent about 20 years in the private sector. I started life after I left the Air Force as an electronics engineer, started life as a um, uh, service desk uh, analyst and worked through um, the ITIL disciplines, um, a few of the techie disciplines and then into management and really my background I would say is service management but I've um, washed up into this role as um, head of infrastructure with um, a relatively medium sized team, about 12 people or so, um, which is roughly 50 50 split between um some permanent members of staff and some contractors with some um best practice knowledge um perfect yeah. so we've obviously um today we've run the event here and craig's been very kindly been a speaker today and one of the topics we've kind of been going through and other guest speakers was their cyber security journey and how everyone's on a different path and a different part of that so it'd be quite interesting to know um what where you are right now what your look that looks like for the next kind of five years and then obviously how at the moment what you're implementing to to support yourself with that because it, it, there was a lot of stumbling blocks and people that you need to talk to and how do you validate things that came up quite a bit so maybe we could reach out about that and and what the journey looks like for you guys at the moment yeah sure so um i think when i came into role we uh, had a cyber security lead but our tooling was what i would sort of say is immature compared to what I've experienced in private sector um, but also um, knowledge wasn't what it is or what I've experienced in the private sector that was lacking as well and that's not to say we didn't have some good technology in our firewall um, perimeter security but um, policies government gov- governance um, w- was lacking um, not helped by me being new into role and trying to navigate the NHS um, and in COVID so. and in COVID, yeah. yeah. So th- there was we had to rapidly uh, expand um, VPN connectivity and make sure that was safe and secure, um, whilst also trying to develop cybersecurity to 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 get it to at least a point that I felt comfortable with. Um, so. Being new into role and new into the NHS posed another challenge in how to navigate the NHS. Yeah. Um, what is required in terms of um, policies, um, how to access funding, how to spend money, um, the whole compliant path to purchase thing yeah. through through that was very new. Mm-hmm. So that, that slowed down a, a few things. Yeah. Um, where we are now is we've purchased um, a couple of tools, um, more recently Pentera, um, and that is proving to be really useful in um, demonstrating that um, there's a lot of work to be done in improving our posture. Mm-hmm. So without you know going into too much detail, I think sometimes we're seen, seen as uh, doom mongers. You know, the end of the world is nigh. It's very Did unlikely we that from everyone today. Yeah. Cyber security or IT, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very unlikely, but it, in the event it happens, it's very serious. So, how do you balance that? And Pentera is helping with, you know, evidencing 
why passwords need to be more complex, for example. Yeah, there was a very good analogy yesterday about we all put um, smoke alarms in our house. That we hope that it's not going to go on fire, catch on fire, but you put a smoke alarm in in the event that is a fire and that's kind of what you guys are doing, aren't you? You're doing worst case scenarios if you put these things in it, you know, it, it should help. But it was quite interesting that that came up yesterday. Hmm. I guess, Phil, you can... Do you test a smoke alarm though? Actually, mine's a le- mine's <laughs> my true. yeah, that's true, and also you know, very good, very good. Um, yeah, yeah, but this part of it, isn't it, uh, for layman's terms, of people understanding it from you know why it's important to plan for the worst, I guess, because it it could happen. Yeah, there's people don't need to um, be malicious in in their attack or or, or their probing. They mm. they could just be curious, and you know they're they're. A, they're at home they're a techie they're, they want to have a little play you know and um you know they don't have to have malicious intent they could just be curious right. we, we we've got a a public facing website occasionally that does get hacked um which is easily resolved mm. inconvenient uh, you know but more um, annoying than yeah, anything yeah 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 i guess you can i guess phil you've been on this journey <laughs> Look at your face, yes. Um, and obviously you guys purchased Pentera as well. Um, how did that support, I guess, a bit of the funding, but also your journey of what was next and what you looked into? Was there anything? I mean, I know every, we very much identified that every trust is very different. Every story is very different. But were there, and are there common themes that we're seeing once someone's bought Pentera within a trust? I think it's about a bit like what we were saying earlier. That, you know, it's about evidencing to boards and to the people within an organisation what the issues are. Because within IT, you kind of know what the issues are, but no one really believes you, and everyone, okay. they all just think everything's going right, to be fine, and let's just keep treading water. So it's about showing them, look, yeah, these passwords are an issue. We've got open shares. We've got, you know, various issues with patches going out. You know, mm-hmm. so maybe you know there's a resource issue around the patch. You know, patching. It's not always technology. Sometimes it's a resource issue. And it's a balance, I think, between getting the right tech and the right people, okay. and then the, the tech that supports the people. Almost, it's, you know, we, when when we're talking to different organisations, yeah, they're all they're all absolutely a different point. You know, some people have, you know, as Craig's saying, they put, they put a good firewall in, and again, that's a really, that's one important piece, and it's mm-hmm. then about what you need to do next. But I think these days, especially, you know, somebody can get in through an email, or there's various different ways of them getting in, and it's making sure that once they're in, you're limiting what they can do, uh, and then okay. that you're going to pick them up and you know be able to remove them. You know, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so it is about. So you're right. It's not all about that, but it's it's all not all about tech. It it is sometimes about policy and process, and you know, like take password complexity. I keep going about that, but <laughs> you know, that's my bugbear at the moment. But um, the technology isn't changing. If you enable more complex passwords, you're just reconfiguring it. it the, the Active Directory is still there. You haven't fundamentally done much with it. Um, but people don't necessarily want to embrace that because they've got to remember a longer password for example even if even if you're only going to change it once a year that they it's about evidencing why that's a good idea to do that and and selling it to them well you know as we talked earlier you know three four word uh three four letter passwords you know it might be easy to remember in and you're only changing it once a year but it's about selling that and evidencing why that's a good idea yeah. yeah, and justifying why you're putting that into place. And you were saying the sm- earlier about the smoke alarm, test the smoke alarm. Well, actually, you can test your password complexity if you want to use that mm. with Pandera and, and see how that's... You can test all manner of bits and pieces to, to, to ensure that you've got the right policies in place. Yeah, because even once you put complex passwords on, yep. somebody has to actually change that password. You've still got service accounts. You've got people in IT that have maybe got direct access to Active Directory. Okay. You know, and you can, hmm. th- there are sort of loopholes or very old accounts that you kind of want to be highlighted because, you know, doing the user accounts probably gets rid of what eighty, ninety percent of your issues around okay. passwords, but you still got those ten percent of accounts, and an attacker coming in is going to go and have a look for service accounts. And we've talked about this before. You know, yeah. they're, they're going to look for an accounts that have maybe got the weaker passwords. Yeah. So many organisations that I mean, the NHS is probably one that they've had, you know, probably from the NT4 days. So they could have passwords that are 25, 30 years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they're scared of changing them because they think that if I change this, next time somebody reboots that server, that clinical system might not come back. Yeah. So, you know, th- th- there's a bit of a minefield, but it's about knowing where those accounts are, and that's definitely one key part of that puzzle. And, you know, it's looking at stale accounts as well, be it computer yeah. or user accounts. 
and how many of those have you got around and, and where's your appetite for that limit is it at 90 days six six months a year where do you as a organization draw that line as to what is stale and yeah. you know when to disable it and that feeds back into other policies such as movers and leavers and and how mm-hmm. various hr systems integrate with things like active directory and how you're making sure that that's updated and you know you know all the checks and balances that that you can do yeah making sure that when people are moving around the organization they're not just gaining privileges as they go okay well so they start at a certain level and within yeah, five I mean, years you might have people higher. that work i mean they could work in one area of the organization and go to another you have a lot of people within hospitals that are on a bank and they could end up working in hr one day in a clinical environment another day Okay. And literally, they'll, they're, when you start looking at their accounts, they're almost yeah. in every group going because they're just moving around the whole organisation. Yeah. It's about cleaning oh, that up because okay. they're quite risky accounts sometimes. Yeah, and it's um, it's the other way around as well. So um, we were looking at it recently with integrating ESR with Active Directory to yeah. to update records, um, and I was quite surprised to learn actually that we could have someone as a permanent employee who might have um, access to trust shares which is not privileged in the sense of privilege but you know um it sends to access to sensitive information they may leave because they've retired or they may leave to go to another role but they're still on trust bank so mm-hmm. we need to leave we need to keep their account open because they need to log on the systems as a bank nurse for ha- perhaps um but what you don't want them to do is have access to the files and folders they had when they were had the day job with us it's about that as well it's a minefield isn't it there's a, a lot yeah. to look at there's multiple ways of looking at it pentera is a good one if, you know it'll pick up an account and once it's got that account it'll see what it can do with it right. be it accessing shares or what what it can get to and then obviously we've got the other piece that we've always talked about that governance piece around what and to do with those a lot accounts. of people people we've spoken to the admin credentials it gets it quick what well, has been getting people's quick hasn't it from from other people we've worked with and stuff that's that's part of it as well isn't it for some people that they can get it pretty fast so it shows you the worst case scenario pretty quick and the route yeah. of how it could do it it's all i mean with the accounts it's all about having least privilege however yeah. you, however you do that you know as, as we're saying you can do that through disabling when people leave or when they move parts in the organization mm-hmm. or just regular reviews of your shares that's that's a basic one yeah you know once a, once a year and even if you don't delegate the admin of your shares to say look department lead these are your shares, these are the people who've got access. I used to put it in a table and send it to them and then say, these are the people who've got access, and they'd, they'd go, no, 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 and you'd be surprised how many came back. Well, we, we're okay. going through a piece of work at the moment, um, migrating um, our, we've got about 10,000 users um, across to 365 and SharePoint, and one of the big pieces we're about 49% of the way through is mm-hmm. we had something in the region of 1,238 root folders on our primary mapped drive wow, okay. and, and about 200 of those didn't have any security groups attached so we were able to go well, okay these don't have any owners but so then around about a, th- um, a thousand uh, that were remaining were going through and saying right okay who's in who's in the security group for this and trying to work out who is the owner now you might have a senior member of management who is the owner but they're not necessarily the person who administers it day to day who approves someone to have access to it and it's taking us about three months and we're only halfway through at the moment identifying you know who's the gatekeeper who authorizes access and it's quite surprising how many people have left the trust but their name is still in 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 an account and that cleanup is it's a huge job Mm. and it's it's about making sure that we don't walk into this again by using products and technologies such as Pentera to make sure that we um, housekeep properly and check that the policies that we put in place to 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 keep things clean and up to date is actually followed. Yeah, and you definitely want to check that before you move to cloud. There's a, such a rush to go to cloud at the minute, isn't it? You want to definitely have that tidy up first and just mm. make sure people got the right access. You mentioned that you were going how how you were going to use pentera as a product so mm-hmm. uh it was benchmarking got thrown around quite a bit today and you said that you were going to look at it doing it quarterly could mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit about 
quarterly and what you're looking to do and how how that's going to work implementing it that quarterly with for you a few of it in your team yes yeah, so, so um one of the so one of the things we're going to do with pentera is um if we put a change through which is uh let's call it significant infrastructure change then we m- will use that to pen test against that to make sure that we haven't missed anything and um uh, created a weakness in in infrastructure as a result Um, we're also using pentera at the moment um, to focus on specific areas where we know we've got problems um, and that that helps us to produce the evidence that supports proposals to change policy which might uh, be not well received if it's making things a little bit more complicated for the end user for example password security Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other way is currently my gut feel is probably quarterly, but we were speaking this morning, maybe yeah. we do it uh, monthly, where we will do a pen test with uh, a certain amount of controls checked. I'm not quite sure how that's going to look yet. And that forms the benchmark of a monthly or quarterly test repeated. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's not like an external test where you might have a different provider every 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 time it's consistent and that will then spawn um what i'm calling cybersecurity improvement plan mm-hmm. uh, that will spawn actions on, on that plan mm-hmm. to go and you know and that might be a small change that we put through to to tweak something or it might be a larger proposal yeah. but i very much want to use it in such a manner that we can benchmark where we're at and evidence closing down those issues mm-hmm. uh, and weaknesses going forwards and it allows you to plan doesn't it it allows you to make that plan what you'll do as a team and and also i guess going through funding it kind of strengthens arguments or why you need to do things or how that's going to help on your journey so i guess it's it's evidence isn't it it's giving you evidence and validation of why you're asking for these yeah, things. yeah i think it, it will help to inform a strategy yeah. And, and there's stuff, there's low-lying fruit that you can do straight away. Yeah. And then there's the stuff, as you said, funding. So what is the strategy? Uh, as we are talking this morning, um, it's become obvious to me, I've, I've only been in role 18 months, but a lot of the NHS funding is cyclic and pots are, are made available at certain points. Mm-hmm. And it's about saying, actually, there's a roadmap here. There's maybe no funding to do this, this and this, so we're going to tolerate it for now. Yeah. But actually, I've got a proposal written and and etc ready to go so that when funding does become available it's there and this is the reason why and by the way this is the evidence to say why it's a great idea yeah no that 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 totally makes sense doesn't it and and what you've seen a lot of people using it for as a tool yeah absolutely and also with pentera as well making sure that you can see that attack inside your network you know again yeah as craig's saying it just it points to lots and lots of different tools passwords visibility endpoint controls you know, and now the ransomware module. Um, yeah, so we haven't quite. We you from what I picked up today in the conversation, you've just got the ransomware module. Literally just, Literally Mon- just. Monday afternoon, so a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah pre- pretty fresh, pretty new, and obviously we've been touching on it today, which we've run a ransomware event about it and having a look at that and what that looks like. Um, that module, I believe. I mean, Gary couldn't make it today, by the way. His yeah. car broke down. He messaged us this morning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, you said that he's really excited about that. And I know, and you, um, what was great about that module, and what you hoping it to achieve, and and how was that also going to support you with the day to day of Pentera, I guess. Yeah. So, so we've got other tools in place, but pen, that that ransom. Um, where module is helping us to make sure other tools are doing their their jobs as they should do and and highlight as i say it's early days but um i know gary was quite um pleased with it he he messaged me uh to say oh you know that the alarms have gone off (laughs) and and i had to stop it pretty quick so it's definitely doing its job good good and then i guess you understand it a little bit more phil about the module and what it actually does and we've had a lot about uh how it fits to frameworks and all that sort of thing so um we had a light touch kind of demo of it today but what would you say is a high level of of why this module is quite exciting or if you were still in craig's position why you'd be like this would be great yeah, it's just a confidence your endpoint security is working um a lot of people have perhaps different security on the servers as they do the desktops mm-hmm. and making sure instead of like stress testing it for injecting just malware this is saying look i'm going to start encrypting and deleting your files 
mm-hmm. you know, and deleting shadow copies, all the sort of things that ransomware do. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we've talked about, you know, it's the fact it's got our evil and they're going to build different ransomware modules within it. Okay. And I think one thing that I learned today from the session that we had was that I didn't realize that the different types of ransomware worked in such a different way. And that was no. one, that was one thing that was highlighted. I get it. I thought I thought okay, they're different, slightly different, maybe different different software. Yeah. But perhaps I don't know if they follow the same pattern. But they were saying that's quite a key thing to be able to test for the different types. So I'm looking forward to them adding to that. And I had a conversation with Pentera yesterday, and mm-hmm. you know, and it's definitely it's a real focus for them at the moment. They're really they've got quite a good roadmap for adding in more ransomware features and other features in the product as well. But yeah, I think that's the main thing that came out today. That it's definitely on the not on the decline it's definitely going to be more of it i yeah. think we all had a bit quite the vendors were happily to tell us how scary it could look like and how much quicker and more sophisticated and they're getting in and easier so like just assume basically assumed you've been you've been they were talking about the encryption time what they were saying that they were using more basic levels of encryption because previously it would encrypt over quite a long period of time whereas now they can do hundreds and thousands oh, so of like, machines in like an 10, hour 10,000 machines they did in an hour yeah i may have mm-hmm. slightly exaggerated that's what we were saying it was ten, yeah that's what i thought it was I think all of us were a bit like, oh, wow. Yeah, you, you physically, humanly can't respond fast enough, can you? And by the time you would respond, there's significant devastation. Yeah, they'll just be going one after another. Yeah. yeah. And, w- and that was another thing, wasn't it? You, you don't you don't want it to happen to you, but you don't really know what you do in, until it happens, isn't it? It's like all those scenarios we've been talking about today of, of, you know, we never want to be breached, but how do we react what's the right thing to do yeah well yeah have we and, got the right toolkit and that touches on one of the challenges um i still face but you know uh, largely i've got my head around at the moment in in terms of what do i do with my team in in the sense of cyber security and my headcount mm-hmm. so you know do, mm. do i increase my physical headcount so we can do more cyber security stuff yeah or do I invest more in tooling, mm-hmm. which can automate responses and, and you know, not get drowned by alerts? Yep. And, and with the likes of Pentera, actually, you know, one or two people in the team can be equivalent to maybe what would have been a small army five years ago. Mm. I think two things came up, actually. You both went here yesterday. Um, I think automation... It, I don't know, yesterday everyone got a little bit closed when we started talking about it, but I don't know if you guys feel the same, that for some people that rings redundancy and that, you know, automation is going to maybe take jobs away and things like that. But you ha- I think of the NHS, there's not enough people to start well, with. Yeah, you, highlight, you highlighted earlier that <laughs> you put, you put you, your job descriptions out there and people, you know, and no one ever got the job because there wasn't enough people to hire from it. But actually what the... Uh, vendor said and and i you know fairly said that automation just does all those jobs that you you can't get done or don't have enough time and then it allows you to get actually get on with the things that really need to get done so it's not actually making anyone redundant it's actually just making you work faster smarter um, and allowing your overstressed teams would that be a fair point of like so much i mean everyone's saying log fatigue today and stuff like that i've actually given them a bit of breathing space to try and fix what needs to be fixed yeah so um i well, mentioned gary he's my cyber lead i inherited him when i picked up the team and he's great and he's really interested and i don't think he's concerned at all about you know being replaced by a bit of automation no. you know he's he's very much in the mindset of this is going to help make my life easier and by the way i can do more good stuff for the trust with it yeah um you know and we've just uh, recently taken on board um a junior engineer who's just come out of university with a cyber security degree um and, and he's starting his work career uh, as a young man and you know he's not phased at all by it it's very much you know this is just part of the landscape automation is here yeah. i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna get made redundant it just means that i've got more tools in my arsenal to to do my job i think i mean mine's marketing world but a lot of our stuff's automated our emails are automated our social media that goes out is automated i don't think for mark there's definitely not less marketing jobs we can just do way more way more content prepare everything in advance quite oh yeah you can be way more and then also if something comes up unexpected it's okay because very same in your world but if something comes unexpected you know and something lands on my desk and Kelly you've got to get this out it's okay because I planned 
and that's all running in the background and then that unexpected thing I can deal with I can sort it I can fix it the team can focus on it we can put all our energy on that so um yeah it was quite interesting because yeah that's what a lot of the a lot of people said that's when it first started coming out automation that was the first kind of feel for everyone but I think that may be changing over time and yeah people know how quick they have to respond now so I think the only way you can do that is with a level of automation anyway because otherwise by the time you've looked at the log and done something it's too late yeah <laughs> yeah and then I think also they were talking about you know AI and stuff you still need a human brain because some decisions have to be made and not everything and you is... want to review what it's done don't you you want to have yeah. a look at, check it was right and so so even as even as more sophisticated as AI gets and then I'm um, learning that there's two types of AI um th- that you still need people at the end of this yeah so, so I mean you know it's not related to cyber security but I was talking to some of our uh, my clinical colleagues earlier this week about AI in the sense of CT scans and things mm-hmm. and she was saying actually there's a notion that the more scans we put through the better the software can be at detecting issues with that scan um, and then someone else said well actually that's not actually the case it doesn't get any cleverer all you're doing as a human when you look at that scan is is refining the parameters for which it fires off an alert mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I think you're right there's, ver- there's various aspects to AI yeah. um, you know but um, AI in the sense of cyber security I think where that's interesting is where it detects um, behaviour that is uncommon or unusual for your environment where you might not have a rule in place to say hey it's fire off an alert if this happens but if it detects something that's unusual it will fire off an alert or take some form of action yeah. because it's not the norm behaviour was a big buzzword definitely too. and over the two days as well because there was, they were talking about how some behaviours can be learn as even if it's bad could be good and yeah that's why you've got to have a mix because yeah obviously, obviously if you're going to spend two weeks learning what your network does and then you learn bad things are good yes for you the saying that's why it's a balance between learning what you in your network plus knowing what bad threats are as well yes because so balance of the two to simplify it for me for, for when uh, we were talking david he was saying um how you know you can have your security cameras and someone could be like living under your staircase um, but if they've always been in that security camera, doesn't panic because they've they've always been under your, your staircase. But that yeah. doesn't actually mean they're a good person underneath your Scott staircase. Confessions of Harry Potter now and um, yeah. <laughs> living under Dobby to, living under yeah, the staircase. Yeah, but it was, it was quite good for him to explain it to me because, like, like, you know, it's learnt that that person has always been that's in there, normal. so it's that's normal. But, yeah. was, but it's not normal to have someone. I think they were talking about true AI as well and saying that yeah. the best way to do that is to unplug it from the internet and see what it does standalone. Yeah. On you its know, own, yeah. So yeah. there was a lot of talk about that. The other, the other thing which we t- we talked about, which kind of surprised me, was that they were saying that there was a cyber expert there, and they were saying that one of the things that attackers were doing was they were just the first thing they would do is go into group policy and disable ATP. Yeah, and that's the first time I'd heard that, and I was like, yeah, I hadn't thought that. That's really quite. And easy it makes to sense, do. though, doesn't it? That's the first thing you're going to try and switch off, isn't it? The thing that's going to ring the alarm. So you need yeah. an account, and you and you can you've done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know. Yeah. Well, so if you're doing a bank job, for example, one of the first things you might want to do is disable the phone a lot, the phone lines before you before you walk in with with your machine gun. Yeah. And why wouldn't a cyber attack do the same? Disable the phone line before you. Yeah, and they could be in the network for months. That they'd, blew have my the, mind. they'd have the time yep. to get the right account to disable that before they you know do, the, do their actual attack. And the other thing they were saying is that sometimes these attacks are a precursor to them actually doing something else. Yeah, like it's, it's like a, creating some noise while we actually do something. Yeah, else. Yeah, like setting a fire over there when they're actually breaking in, isn't it? It's to distract. It's to distract you from what you're meant to be looking yeah. at. But I found that fascinating how that what they actually try to do is dump it in there quite early on, and then to, so it can learn for as long as possible until it actually goes and does damage i guess it's quite quite scary of how long what do we say was normally how long was months. it months months mm-hmm. yeah about 90 days and they're just yeah. hanging out in your environment so that's quite scary i guess and that's why yeah you need the tools that are going to pick them up but was there anything i guess on your cyber security journey you've been very honest today you're uh, early on it you're ready within your team you obviously landed in covid so there was a lot going on um is there anything that today particularly that you saw or um, you hadn't considered before or is something now that you may put in your plan going forward because it was something you hadn't considered before? Yeah, so I, I, as I mentioned um, this morning, I, I think it's 
fairly easy to pick off the low-lying fruit some of the things that you need to do first thing mm -hmm. you know that might not cost too much money it's just a policy or configuration and they're they're maybe staring you in the face and they're quite easy but it's now moving on to you know what is a more strategic roadmap what are the more difficult things to do that might need more funding and i think um i think you know, on reflection the our cyber posture is quite reactive at the moment mm -hmm. um you know for all the reasons that we've previously explained but it needs to shift gear into a more proactive mode mm -hmm. while still being reactive yeah. um you've mentioned log fatigue and and things and what you don't want to do is have so much tooling and so many logs that you've got to go through that you can't see the wood for the trees but we do need to find a way forward of being of, of seeing those subtle changes of behavior and and adjusting our posture accordingly and working out uh the right combination of tools to suit our environment mm -hmm. and and that's very much the next steps for us you know and, and pentera is part of that by helping to identify some of those weaknesses uh, evidence that through benchmarking and, and some of the reports that it generates so that we can actually weave that into the strategy going forward so we can put uh, proposals to one side when fundings become available mm -hmm. and and then you know in the event um, I win the lottery and uh, you know <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, people have will have that governance behind them to say actually the thinking is this this and this and that's why that was put in place and that's part of a longer journey mm. you know um, that's very much the next stage and some of the key speakers today were quite um, informative in shaping some of my thinking around what that roadmap might be especially oh, in terms of detecting behaviors um before um and before real action happens so mm -hmm. just detecting that slight change in i don't know network traffic for example or uh scanning sca Look scanning in file shares yeah. so nothing's actually happened uh in terms of um disruption nothing's been deleted or encrypted for example but they're seeing that subtle shift in in behavior it's that's that's interesting and that's part of the next stage i think and i also quite like that they were quite honest weren't they of saying when you're picking your your tool set that you make sure you, you properly test it yeah and test it and make sure that you know what you're buying and it does what it says on the tin we do we do that even before we sell it yeah, I know we do that internally, but I mean, I I've, I've, well. I've yeah. been to big, you know, exhibitions where there's so much and so how do you know? And they all say the same things and like, you know, AI, I thought was AI, but I, that's also opened up. And it's I think a bit the, of a buzzword, isn't it? Sort of. Yeah, there was a very, very good analogy, wasn't it? Of what he um, said was... Um, the knife wasn't it you could you could it's a salmon knife it's a salmon knife yeah exactly yeah. it can do a lot of things um it can open your can of beans but what you actually need is a, a, a um a tin can opener and actually we've got to really look under the hood of a lot of these things because yeah i mean they've got great marketing some of them <laughs> so yeah anyway. I, I think that's where um and, and that's where people have different approaches so you could have someone um making a decision who has got a lot of background industry knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and you could have someone making a decision who, who has less and, yeah. and it's you know clearly the these events that you guys put on are really useful for that because it brings vendors into the room that can be questioned yeah. um, you know and other people are there from other organizations that help question and challenge and you know you get a when you i know we're still in the aftermath of covid but we're starting to physically see people yes. face to face now it's very different nice. to a teleconference but when you're seeing these vendors face to face it's it's a, it's a different level of confidence or you get a different level of understanding about no. how they are presenting their product and their technology yeah and i think they were all i don't know if they were very complimentary and worked together and they i just did, they didn't hide it behind anything did they they mm. were quite they were quite open like in fact they were saying you know if you if you, if you buy our technology uh you know test it yeah. you know point pentera at it and test it pull it apart see what happens and right? i think think that they what they're not afraid to do that is kudos to them to be fair because i think it'll pull it apart if they if they can't stand mm. up for it absolutely yeah what are we at what time are we at? 
35 minutes. Oh, wow, okay. that's a good amount. Bloody hell, yeah, we get to 35 minutes. I don't know. I, th- I thought you were going to say like 15. <laughs> no, it's gone really, really quickly. It has gone it's quickly. All, wow. Well, from what I can tell, it's all really good content and it flows really nicely. Okay. Anything yeah. anyone would want to add? No. I think we nicely touched on Pantera about it being too salesy. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Nice, fine. That was Lovely. Good. Beautiful, done. Cool. That was, that, was, that was easy. Yeah. Craig, it's like a first time. Like, you can That's do the first all the time, time we've asked for the time when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> there's been, a, I have to say, there's, oh. not recording anymore. There's been, there's been a few in there that we've been like hmm. quite long. <laughs> do you need to do a sign off or anything, or is that it? You're just gonna. Do you, you want to do a little close? Just say thank you for coming along. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Coming on the podcast. Yeah, Kelly does that. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Get him like that. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. It's because I killed him the other week. What did we do? Six in a row. Oh, like no. all day. So yeah. by the end of it, he was just like death by podcast. Death yeah, by podcast. This, it was but I'm trying watch. to be nice because then it means if we do six in a row, we don't have to record for like another. Yeah, but you weeks. do know though that men have got a lower word count per day than women. That's probably why he gets annoyed with me. <laughs> Constantly <laughs> talking. Stop talking at me. I didn't butt in on you in the presentations though. No, that was so much better. Thanks. Last time, last time I, started doing, I started doing the company intro, I said about three lines, and then all of a sudden Kelly chops up, and I never got another word in, and I was like, what's going on? Let's go get my sandwiches. Yeah, let's go get my sandwich. I've got well, an email we, to write somewhere. We hadn't really gone through it, had we? And I think it was a bit nervous energy. It was the first time anyone had been in, and it was a bit, bit word vomity, wasn't it? And I did overtake. Fairly, I did overtake. Okay. All right. So that's a wrap. So thank you very much, Craig, for spending some time with us. Well, a lot of time with us over the last 24 hours. Oh, you're welcome. Feel. So we'd like to thank you very much for popping into HQ. And um, hopefully we'll have you as a guest very again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs>